Yesterday, I made a trip into Seattle. It was disturbing. For whatever reason, the um, promoters of what has been done to me over the last 50 years decided to give a cue to the porcupine. They call it scene. to treat me respectfully and attentively. The time for which was largely long past. But it made me reflect when I got home on the scary world situation for young people, particularly. And um, what I could say in advisory based on my experience, and of course my observations, For every this, there is a that when it comes to superpower relations. When I lived in Davenport, I saw the monstrosity of a bug infested hotel with Latino children living in it. The only place that immigrant families were allowed to go. And nightly wandering local Iowans would come and defecate on the outside of it. Last night, I continued my occasional lookings into concerning um, right-wing terror coming from the Ukraine towards Russian people. And no less a persona than Hillary Clinton was admitting that we had armed the people in Afghanistan who we then had to fight so they could um, do ruin to Russia and Afghanistan. And one wise owl said, can't you see that coming in the Ukraine? It's ironic to think of Russia as fighting some of our battles for us, but it's working class people. We had a common interest in toppling the Axis. Our belief that the Axis could be redeemed by better judgment from their leaders has somewhat been vindicated, but it has also been soured by our inability to extend the same admission to those who fought against the Axis, who we felt were somehow inferior to us. There's no such thing as an axis of evil. George Bush is damaged socially and psychologically by the idea that creating enemies is a necessary machine to lubricate the economics of convenient war. Now let me tell you about the parable that I consider a lesson from my trip to Seattle yesterday, which contained the fruit of relaxations of tension towards me and allowed my mind to wander just a little bit when I went into Kinokaniya Bookstore, a Japanese environment that I have long hoped I could make proud of me somehow.
Well, one of the things I have long known about Chinatown is that despite its poverty, it is a wonderful, beautiful place. The elderly suffer, but they hold themselves up. It is the one place in the world of the United States where there is a true sense of commons. And with the commons, the validity of the human race. Yet it's heartbreaking when instead of finding a place, niche creation, to preserve, to plant, to be humane, realities come and deface the stores, leaving the young married attendants in tears, scraping defacement off the windows. It's sad for me as an American. And I have often besieged the public in Seattle to kindly desist and be more helpful. Institutionalized problems like racism are not gold mines to be hacked into and exploited. They're wounds on our self-esteem that need salve and healing. But to get to my point, one of the things that I learned in Chinatown, which was very important to me, was the ethic of preservation. Now true, some of this preservation pertains to the earth, the Danny Wu Memorial Gardens. But a lot of it is legacy projects, memorial walls, heritage museums, continuing the tales of small stores that have perished. The wonderful tales of the independent press where you can still pick up a newspaper and feel the lifeblood of the United States beating in your hands. The wonderful presence a free speech and intelligent judgment in a newspaper. How marvelous. And it's like that every day, even after this monstrosity visited on us. I guess. It's next to impossible for me to hide my love of Chinatown. After all, I lived there for 12 years and mangled as a deaf man. I came away the better for it. Preservation is an ethic there. It's not terribly well understood by the young. They want modern they want new opportunities. But somehow the dialogue continues between the young and the restless and the old and wise, as it should everywhere. Now, what this brings me to is my visit to the bookstore. I love to trot all up the steps upstairs where the literature used to be and I would browse trying to pick out Sosuke Natsumi from Morio Gai wonder who the other precious writers were Rihanna Suzuki I don't remember how to pronounce his last name And sometimes there were books that looked like marvelous modern classics. You pick out current affairs. 
recognizing Vladimir Putin. Liz Truss, that horrible one. Ichiro Suzuki. Shinsuke Abe. The many marvelous human beings in leadership around the world. See modern uh, paintings on decorating the covers of small dimension books that people imagine read on the subways. The bullet trains of Tokyo. And of course, there were all there are always the knickknacks, the little pair of heads, and Sky Lord Warriors, Mothra. But over the years, the priorities and distribution of things in the bookstore have changed. I mean this as a poem with respect to Russia. Now, children's things are upstairs, pulp magazines, pulp books, flashy for fantasy, cities in the sky, posters, things well worth seeing, Gijon models. The Anka music is gone. Apparently nobody bought the Anka music. Maybe it was returned or maybe it's in storage, but there's no rack for Anka. And Anka is a beautiful species of soft rock. Certainly there's no Koto music, which takes a good deal of inborn talent to appreciate. And that's the first time I use the word appreciate in this talk. But appreciate and preservation are matchless words that begin together. As I stood looking over the balcony, or as I stand looking over the balcony often, I tried to pick out the areas of the store where the books now are. I even asked an attendant to help explain to me where they were. And I noticed that they've changed. They've changed many times over time. It's not that they aren't still there, but they're in different places. And it brings me to the remorse that Russia must feel in contemplating the past. Because when something was missing, Putin is a very perceptive person when it comes to Russia's past. There are things that you could talk to him about endlessly and agree with every single word. And you'd be surprised how much of it matches the sentiments of the United States of America. But he appreciates what Russia went through that caused those situations. Someday, looking back at COVID, people will say America behaved very, very badly. But those of us who lived through it will also remember that we behaved very, very honorably as well. It's a mixed bag in that way. But if I didn't have my experience of the past to look around the store and remember how things were before, it would make it difficult for me to say how they had changed, where it was going. It would make it difficult for me to size up what was missing or what had been there that made it the way it was and what is there now that makes it the way it is. America's specious media is lackluster. Not really just when it comes to Russia. You can see it in the way that rivals tear into each other with gossip 
and silliness. I'm sure that's very fun, but it isn't the meaning of the philosophy for free speech. The meaning of the philosophy for free speech is to subject observations to fact checking, checks and balances, not just to be barking dogs of the administrative party line. Remorsefully, I have to say the problem is virtually universal. But one of the things I have found in the Kenneth Kinnear bookstore are academic books regarding so-called communist China. There are people in Chinatown who are bitterly opposed to the communist government of China. But I've read about the history of China. Indeed, I've read about the history of North Korea. The culture is worthy of appreciation. The culture is worthy of preservation. The culture is worthy of friendly coaching of reform is America. America needs to mind its own gates in the sense of the moral perceptions that we bring to the world. Our bias is going to be our undoing. I'm not saying that I don't think we need to be careful when it comes to tyranny and slavery, but there's no doubt and anybody who knows my experience, that we have an enemy within when it comes to tyranny and slavery. I don't mean to be alarmist, but in order for us to have a legacy of preservation, we need to square up with the fact that alarmism has become an endemic condition for us. It's become chronic, it's become scary, it's become self-perpetuating and self-fulfilling. We need to tone down the rhetoric and start practicing better judgment when it comes to appreciation and preservation. The Twitter industry has made it possible for me to keep track of the concerns of the marvelous youth movement to preserve the planet. I know from my book of tales that this outcome came with a premeditated deluge from the fossil fuel industry. And that's very painful for me. It makes me irate. As a person who tries my level best to follow Pope Francis, I know that anger can be maddening. I try to solve my anger by looking with hope that people can wake up to the aspirations of the young, to have a planet, to have change, to have meaningful dialogue now, not never. And so I keep in touch with the Twitter industry. One of the more painful items of interest that came across the screen was the fact that 70% of the animal and wildlife from 100 years ago is now gone. We are only at 1.1 degrees Fahrenheit change in the climate and we're trying to fend off at 1.5 and yet the changes are already so catastrophic that a third of Pakistan is underwater. I played with you to read the Egyptian minister's memoranda about the upcoming COP27. Stop being greedy. Be sensible. Invest in loss and damage mitigation throughout Africa and South America, Latin America, the developing world. These are people who we need. These are people who we need to have safe healthy, well, productive, and contributing. There are friends, there are extended, extended family, in the brotherhood of man. Please 
think about the fact that there are some sensible explanations for what happened in the Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine, I realize that I am morally obligated to go along with the sanction of the United Nations majority, and I do. But Eastern Ukraine is predominantly Russian, and there were some very brutal, unprovoked persecutions of Russians. Yanukovych was elected. There was a coup. People will tell me that I'm falling for Soviet propaganda, for former Soviet propaganda, Russian propaganda. I don't think I am. I recall and have often spoken out against the Bush administration's ruthless cruelty to Russia after they brought down the Berlin Wall. I've learned over the years of the mysterious expansion of NATO by Clinton, despite promising we would not expand NATO. Where was the love for Russia's gesture of reform? It was absent. When the Czech intellectuals, just to move the issue out of the hot war situation to the Velvet Revolution, Ivan Svatok had led Prague Spring. He came once a darling of the American neoconservatives to California to teach and discovered that everyone disapproved of him. I thought you supported him. No, not now that we know he has Marxist leanings. Many of the Czech intellectuals were parliamentarians with Marxist leanings. Yanukovych was one of the people who stood for reform movement that had parliamentarianism with Marxist leanings. People will say that Marxist doctrine is so powerful that it is inherently contradictory to parliamentarianism. That's actually not the case. People who agree to the ballot also agree to discussion. Open discussion about Marxism was said to be so hard in America by Ivan Svatak that you might as well have been Galileo trying to explain to the church, the medieval church, that the earth revolves around the sun. All Marxism really teaches, with some serious flaws that are under review by critical scholars, is that working class people earn their daily bread and are entitled to life support, peer support, and protection from abuse. That's all. What's so controversial about that? It isn't controversial. We were unable to meet Russia halfway bestow the garlands of roses on them that they were due when they took down the Berlin Wall. The problem goes all the way back to 1945 when American and Russian soldiers were congratulating each other uh, over the victory that was so tragic, especially for Russia and for European Jewry over the Axis. I myself was bewildered by the stories of the atomic bombings. But one thing I had hoped and had been led to believe was that it was a metaphor for all of humanity to stop it. This was sabotaged by two gruesome little dudes known as the Dulles brothers, the highest ranking Axis undercover operators ever to infiltrate America's high command. They managed to kill the Kennedys and launch the lucrative for the fossil fuel warriors, the Vietnam War. 
and to steer many people misguided in the NAACP to view Asia acrimoniously. There is no what's next. We all know what's next if we continue down the path of ruin. My point is that it's troubling and sad for me to think that there are people who are disoriented by the changes in the bookstore in Russia. Things that were missing, missing pieces. But American intellectuals have a moral obligation to be helpful. We have a moral obligation not to perpetuate dogma and hatred, but to perpetuate scholarship and grants. And I hope that when this crisis winds down, because we all know it has to, that America will answer negotiations for peace with negotiations for peace and open their minds to the hopes of people all over the world for recognition, appreciation, and preservation. Russian scholars have tried to preserve Russia. And in the disorientation that comes with missing pieces, there's no substitute of dogma and hatred from the West that only contributes to the maddening disorientation. Russia has shown the capacity to reform and the desire to reform, but not along the one track American model. They can't even reward people when they do what we ask. Ivan Svatak led Prague Spring. And yet when he came to California, he found the intellectual doors closed. What gives? It doesn't make any sense. I think what gives is the mind of those trollish little men, the Dulles brothers and the infantilism of the Bush oil profiteers and their lackeys like Clinton and Obama. Biden is a better man. But I think it's too ruthless to say we won't negotiate. What choice do we have? It's not surrounded to nuclear blackmail. It's opening our minds to the fact that, that there's some truth to what Russia has been saying. There is some. I'm a witness that there is some. I recall sitting in a laundromat in Montana, enraptured with the hopes of the Berlin Wall coming down, having just seen a chunk of it that someone shared with me. Imagining what Martin Luther King would say when an administrator from the Bush regime came babbling about the ever more menacing Russia that would rise. Who would answer such a gift with such a preposterous sentiment? I'm sorry. There is some truth to what they said.